משה's סטודיו, או קליניק, או you don't allow to say קליניק, אוקיי? It was in his office, אוקיי? That's a place where he received his people and he gave lessons and we studied every day for one hour. It wasn't like training program right now that you study ATM and then you study FI. We studied just FI, functional integration. At that time it wasn't functional integration. It was improving your ability. He developed the functional integration only later on when he went to San Francisco and he needed to develop a, a name. The Americans need a name for something. So, uh, <laughs> so we sat around one table, 13 of us. You remember, Ruti? The first thing he told us when we came here, one of the things he told us, in my method, I have no routines, except sometimes. <laughs> we studied six days a week, 10 months a year for three years. And then one day we asked Moshe, can we do it three times a week instead of every day and need to drive? And he got angry and he said, what do you think you are studying in university? You need time to take it in, to think about it, to practice. The way he taught us was that one of us needed to lay down and he gave us. Immediately we need to give him back. So he was lying and we gave him lesson. And what do you think he said at the end? <laughs> That's not FI. I was lucky really that uh, I, I at that time decided to study with him. That's all. So my name is Amos Hetz. I met Moshe in 56 went to Alexander Yanai and thought I'm a dancer. My back started to ache in such a way and I knew Moshe very well. He used to come here twice a week. There was one small room and Moshe was treating me. Then he went to the States and he said, today it will be the last lesson before I'm going. And what did he do? He asked me to lie on the back. He didn't touch me, and he gave me a lesson. Thank you. <laughs> the story about the man that he was treating when the man was sitting on a chair and Moshe was working with him, very tired, and his head is falling. But finally, the man got up and said, Moshe, that was the best lesson you ever gave. And Moshe understood the message in it and he changed the whole direction of his work and he understood that when he doesn't interfere with his thinking it's the best thing. This was at the time that we learned in the early 70s. Yeah. His brother used to live here and his mother used to leave her part of the time as well. His mother was a painter and Moshe always came to Baruch to eat during lunch. And Baruch cooked. Actually, the food wasn't so important. But the way they talked about politics, uh, the way Baruch really adored Moshe and supported him all his life, till the end of his life. Somebody who knew Moshe Feldenkrais from his 
child. He was a child. <laughs> yes. I'm not Meskin. Uh, yes. Hello. Nice to see you all. Um, first, graduated, went to France, studied in the Polytechnique, finished it most likely extremely well, and he was uh, Julio Curie, right hand uh, scientist. Julio Curie, as you know, was the son of Madame Curie, and, uh, and he left uh, France hastily. He went to England, he worked there for the war effort. While doing that, in France and England, he dealt a lot with judo. And he kind of gave the European audience the knowledge about uh, Japanese judo, which was in hiding. And of course, somehow, because he was a sort of a genius, a self-educated man, and at the same time, a man who could combine many disciplines and understanding altogether of physics, of judo, of um, anatomy, of the wisdom of the East, and slowly, slowly, he developed a system while he was still a scientist. And then when he came to Israel and started working with the army, at the same time he, he started working with people. So of course my father and I were the first guinea pig yeah. that he ever worked with. Mm -hmm. He left the army, started really seriously devoting himself to his system, in which uh, he had groups and people, individually and people who had uh, all sorts of difficulties. I remember my father in the first few lessons, first of all when he got up he got taller, really, practically taller, and he started laughing out of, out of happiness. My mother used to call him a, a part of the furniture of the house because he used to come every like evening or afternoon. The reason why he bought this apartment up here and lived here was because of the vicinity of my father, of my parents. But that was his home. When I got married, we had a child, and when he was around, you know, five, six, seven, we see that he cannot, he cannot jump. He cannot jump, he was extremely awkward. So my wife got worried, and she went to an orthopedic uh, a doctor. And he said, well, he has uh, scoliosis. scoliosis that he should be dealt with. <laughs> the other orthopedic uh, doctor said, eh, well, he has one leg shorter than the other. And then we said, why do we go there? We have Moshe. <laughs> so Nomi and I went to Moshe, and Moshe said, what was the process of his growth until he walked? He started, you know, turning up, and then he started crawling crawling like an Indian, like that. And he never walked on four. And Moshe said, well, he lacked a, a stage in his development. <laughs> you know what he did? He didn't even work with him. He said, send him to judo and he will be fine. Well, my son got a brown belt when he was a child still and started leaping like a, 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 a vault jumper or whatever and uh, he was terrific. This was Moshe, a well-versed man and a great teacher. In a strange way, Moshe had uh, sometimes uh, a very childish quality, I must say. Wonderful, stubborn, childish uh, uh, quality. That's it, I think. That's all right. Thank you. to live two streets from here to the right. 
and uh, I met Moshe the first time when I uh, taught in uh, in the college seminar kibbutzim. The way he built the lesson, I have to come and to do those lessons. So he said, yes, I have in Alexander Yonai. I said, oh, it's very close to the place where I lived. It was something really unbelievable. And I can tell you, there were times that I could walk and come here by foot. And there were times that I really couldn't after having birth and injured my back, I couldn't walk. And on the way back, just like nothing just could walk wonderfully. But the psychological part, when I came home, always my husband looked much nicer, my children didn't bother me, I could sleep better, and everything in the house was much nicer. So not only physically, or also psychologically, I could feel after the lesson that it was great. <laughs> זוכרים את הגברת בן סירה שהייתה בטוחה שמשה הוא מספר שניים שלה לפחות והיא הראתה למשה כמה תנועות והוא עשה מזה שיעורים ויום אחד אני ראיתי שהיא עובדת כל כך בכוח שזה יזיק לה רק הנחתי יד ורציתי להגיד לה רבקה, קצת יותר ברוגע אז היא נתנה לי מכה על היד שלי וכמובן היא סיפרה את זה למשה, ואז משה בא אליי, וכאן הלב של הסיפור. אלי, אפילו אם זה לא מוצא חן בעיניך, תיגש אל רבקה ותבקש ממנה סליחה. אתה עוד תלמד מדוע אין לעזור. אוקיי, זה הסיפור. I studied here for years and I never talked to Moshe one word. I read in the newspaper that in Tel Aviv University they opened the sport department and I had an idea that I will go there and teach Feldenkrais. I wrote them a letter, I told them I studied with Feldenkrais many years, I don't have any credentials, no certificate, if they want they can call him on the phone. Um, that's it, and I went there and I got the job. But then I needed to go to Moshe to ask permission. <laughs> so I come at the end of the day, I saw Moshe alone. Usually there were like 50 people lying on the floor, and uh, he was schlepping his reel-to-reel, -reel big suitcase of the recorder, the heavy one. And I told him, look, I have an opportunity to teach your method. Uh, is it okay? And he said, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea if it's very bad or very good. <laughs> and then he said, you know, I think to teach some people my individual work, and I think you are suitable. Before he started, he said, it is very important for me to teach you my individual work, because then it will show it is scientific. Otherwise, it's just one... Uh, talent of an uh, exceptional person. And then he said something also very sad, and I will tell it to you. He said, I know you will take my, what I'm teaching, and you will go into the world, and you will make a lot of money, and I will be old and sick, and you will leave me. <laughs> that wasn't quite so, but, but somehow that's what happened. He was a, something like a fourth generation to the Baal Shem Tov, which is the founder of the 
Jewish mysticism, which is called Hasidut. His uh, grandfather, Pinchas from Kurutz, he was named after him, Moshe Pinchas Feldenkrais. And this uh, grandfather of his was uh, very important in the development of Judaism. He had the first printing shop where all the, it's called the Talmud, the biblical writing of Judaism. The Tsar at the time, he didn't like the fact that things are printed and they can't read what is written there. So Pinchas and his uh, brother, they were exiled to Siberia. And after many years, I don't remember exactly how many, 15 or 20, they came back. If you manage to come back from this, uh, these prisons, uh, you, something happened. It was a miracle that happened to you. Okay. So this is the place of Moshe. This is his brother Baruch that was the full opposite of him in every, in every sense. His mother, Shendl, and his father. His mother was very important in his life. He, he really adored also the principle of motherhood. I remember reading a piece in the newspaper telling about Feldenkrais's mother starting to paint in such age, so beautiful. I don't understand my son. He had such a beautiful job, such interesting, so uh, respectable. And he moved into touching asses. <laughs> I remember the day when we came here and um, I would like to tell you something about the way he was dying because he was sick but he did not feel sorry for himself. He had an interest to, to watch the process. He was kind of quiet and when he died he was like 35 kilos. He managed to stay and not die. And the way he was in, in karate, they have an exercise, they hold the bird on the hand. They don't project fear. So the bird comes to their hand, and every time the bird wants to take off, they lower the hand, and she cannot take off. And I, I said, that's what happened to Moshe. He could go into the dying, and it, it didn't take him. He came back.
watching and I'm sure that if Moshe is somewhere there looking down, he is, he wouldn't admit it, but he's happy. <laughs>